We're going to walk you through as many hardware platforms as we can in a short period of time. So let's start with the Arduino Uno. This guy right here basically has 32K of flash, 2K of RAM, 1K of storage. Uh, at least that's how I think of it as storage. And you, you, you measure things here in kilobytes. In the microcontroller world, especially the embeddable world, it is a kilobyte type platform. Uh, the cool thing about this is because it's open source and it's been so widely used and so insanely popular, you can figure out how to use it. Uh, think of any kind of question you might have. You Google for that and you're going to find an answer when it comes to the Arduino. And that's one thing I really appreciate about the Arduino environment. Uh, but because it's open source, other people have come out and created their own offerings. And you can see this one here comes from SparkFun. You can see SparkFun listed there. And this is an Arduino Pro Mini, tiny little guy. Uh, and it looks kind of like those hairy caterpillars. caterpillars. Um, but these are the headers that I soldered on to give it, you know, a breadboard. And then this where the programmer goes in. Uh, so there's a programmer unit, which I don't have nearby here, that you would then connect it up to your USB. This is what the Pro Mini looks like by default. But this is essentially the same power as this big guy back here. Same, different form factors, but the same programming model, the same programming IDE uh, as before. Now, neither one of these have connectivity. So neither one of these Arduino platforms have connectivity, but there's another platform here that I'm going to show you. This is known as the Light Blue Beam. Let me see if I can get the autofocus to autofocus. There we go. The Light Blue Beam uh, has an onboard uh, Bluetooth LE, Bluetooth 4 uh, radio built into it, and you can see there's the uh, specific radio antenna, or built-in antenna right there, and it has a proto board. And you can use that proto board to solder on things, like in this case, I soldered on a button and uh, so that you can actually track click events. And you can see it actually turns the light on when you click right there. <laughs> and that's what it does. But also on the computer side, you can track those Bluetooth events coming through that click. You can see there's a coin cell battery operating this guy. Uh, and I've gone through a lot of these batteries based on what I was trying to do. But it will last for days uh, interacting um, just off that one little coin cell battery. So keep that in mind. So let's show you the programming environment for that. Uh, you basically get this thing called the bean loader. And you can see that I have the bean here. Uh, and but, by the way, was actually called button. Um, but by default, it truncates things down to four characters. And now I'm dealing with the butt. And in this case, the bean being the one on my uh, desktop here, I'm going to connect to it. That's this guy right here on screen. Uh, so this one right here specifically, we're going to connect over Bluetooth from the laptop. And you can see it says connected now. And I can do things like blink LED. So if you look at the LED over here on this side, and I hit blink LED, you'll see it light up in red there. So that's how you know you're really connected to it. And the programming model is very straightforward. You use the Arduino IDE. Um, and in this case, I might want to put on, uh, it has an RGB LED, it should be noted. And so I can make it uh, blue, green, red in that order. I can hit verify here. So it actually compiles the sketch, the Arduino sketch. And then you come back over here and hit right click and say program sketch. And if all goes well, you'll see it uploading the sketch right there. So 20%. And it keeps on going. So it takes a little while. That's because over Bluetooth, you can't transfer massive data load, right? It's a relatively small pipe over Bluetooth. But in this case, we are programming it wirelessly, an over-the-air update. And as soon as it gets done there, we'll go back to our camera. You should see it start to flash. And there it goes blue, green, red. You can see it right there. Okay. So that's the light blue bean in a nutshell. And I really do enjoy working with it because it's cool to be able to work with it wirelessly and it does have a Bluetooth capability built into it. And you can integrate it with other components later, like when you see our Linux-based platforms, you know, you can actually integrate the Lightboot Bean in with your Raspberry Pi as an example through that Bluetooth connection. So let's keep moving along here. Uh, I also want to show you the embed. And the uh, embed device here is the NXP LPC1768. And you can kind of tell by its name that, hmm, it might actually be more for electrical engineers. So that's actually a giveaway I think you'll find is if it has a name like XY4291, yeah, that's not necessarily for the general public at large. It's more for electrical engineers and people who are really in the know. And these embed devices um, are, are pretty powerful. So this is actually a much more powerful controller. It is a 32-bit arm. Um, and let me check my notes here make sure I have it right. The, it specifically has 32K of RAM as an example. So, you know, it's, it's 16 times more memory than what the Arduino has. And it's also a much more powerful processor. Now, there's no connectivity built into this guy. He is set up to go right into a breadboard. Um, and actually, what I'll do here is let me show you one that's already been configured. And so, already been breadboarded up. And so, you can see what this guy looks like right here. Uh, so, I have him on a battery, and I have him just plugged in to the battery. So, let me turn on the battery. And then he'll come to life. He'll boot right up, as a microcontroller should. And he'll start running the code. In this case, 
uh, sorry for the glare there, but you can see it's just got an accelerometer and this little OLED screen on it. Um, so this guy's powerful enough to read all those accelerometer rating, uh, readings and then just move that little dot around on screen based on my movements here with my hand. So, and it'll run on this little battery, which is for recharging your iPhone or something. It'll probably run on this for days and days. I haven't actually tried to uh, wear it out or anything, but it doesn't draw much power. So one thing nice about the Embed platform is many, many hardware vendors are implementing for it, uh, as it's true with ARM in general. So you're going to actually be able to get embed components or microcontrollers from many different players. Uh, this guy being the NXP uh, platform is the standard one you get in the, in the default dev kit. Uh, and this demo you see right here is one of the standard demos you get the dev kit uh, from Spark Fun. And so that's why I want to show it to you. So let me drop that over there. And I want to show you the programming environment for that. So this is actually the uh, one nice thing about the embed is it gives you a web-based IDE. And again, you're working in a C++ land here. Uh, here's a Blink program uh, that you would see pretty pretty straightforward, right? Again, you have your loop and you have your LED one, which means high or on, uh, wait, and then LED off, and then uh, wait again. Uh, so what's funny about that to me is it's programmatically very similar to what you see in the uh, Arduino world. Uh, and this is an example of the Spark IDE, and you can kind of see the programming model is very similar. There's basically a setup section, a loop section, and that's where you put your logic for the microcontrollers in that little loop. Uh, to kind of show you something a little more advanced here, uh, we'll show you what was actually running on that um, that screen with the accelerometer. So you can see it include the accelerometer uh, header uh, library, include the LCD uh, library, and then initialize those here at the top of the section. And then in your main, you can see it sets up a baud rate, specifically interact with the, um, uh, the LED, or LCD, I should say. And then it uses those accelerometer values and draws in that circle. So relatively straightforward programming logic here. And, and one thing that's really cool about the uh, embed-based world, right? It, again, it works across multiple pieces of hardware. But you just have to hit compile here. It goes through its compilation process. And you can see I'm targeting the LPC 1768. It drops the bin here in my downloads here at the bottom of the screen. And all I do if I have that plugged in, which I don't right now, is drag and drop it over to um, that device. So it shows up as a standard USB device in your operating system. And you just drag and drop it on. And that's how you flash it as an example. So that's the how I think of the embed world. Incredibly powerful uh, microcontrollers, probably more targeting the, uh, the electrical engineer amongst us, uh, but I really like those guys and they've been a lot of fun to work with and they come ready to drop into your breadboard. Uh, let me show you this other guy here. So let's move some things out of the way, make some more room here. And I'm going to show you this guy right here. This is a Spark Core. So this is like an Arduino also, another microcontroller. Again, you program in C++ style architecture. Let me pull it off its breadboard right here. But I'll just keep it there for safekeeping. He is powered up, but he's not actually connected to the computer. He's just on, this is just a power cable connecting him into a wall, uh, wall jack. Um, you can see the little light there that's indicating he's breathing CN, cyan. I always forget how you say that color. And he's happily connected to our network right now. So this guy is a Wi-Fi chip on top and the underlying uh, processor underneath. But basically, it's an Arduino, if you will, microcontroller with Wi-Fi built right in. So kind of like the light blue bean with Bluetooth built in, this guy has Wi-Fi built in. So because of that, it's been one of my more, my favorite microcontrollers to work with. So let me just set him back over here. We're not going to try to make it pretty. Um, to set him down. They also have a web-based ID environment. You can see this one is for blinking the LED. What I'm going to do here is make sure that that specific core is selected. So that's core 2. That's what little star represents. And if all goes well, I'm going to hit the flash button here. And you, can, you can't quite see the light there. Let's pull it closer. See how it's blinking rapidly? That basically means it's getting its flash over the air update. So right from the web-based IDE, uh, there's no dragging and dropping or anything. You just basically issue the command across the internet uh, and across the cloud, and it knows to actually get that flash. And now you can see this little LED here is blinking away based on that change that I just made. So I can turn off that little LED. Uh, let me go back to my code environment over here, uh, and I have a turn off little command as an example. And I can basically say flash that again, and you can see it goes rapidly through this blinking magenta that basically says the flash is coming over the air, um, and then it'll of course turn off that code, or basically turn off LED, make it low in this case here, <laughs> so it won't be blinking any longer. Uh, it does take a few moments, though, to go through that flashing process. You notice it flashed green there briefly. That's when it's reconnecting to the Wi-Fi. But now it's programmed, and you don't see the LED blinking anymore. 
Um, so I, I really love that over the air update with the Spark. And of course, by default, it is on Wi Fi, my local Wi Fi here. And you can just make that update kind of in real time uh, to that environment. Okay, and it should be noted that this Spark Core, it's about $40, $39, I believe. But the next iteration is the Photon, more powerful. It actually is going to come with a, um, uh, this guy specifically had 128K of flash and 20K of RAM. Uh, supported only uh, B and G when it came to 802.11, the Wi-Fi, uh, but the Photon is specifically going to support um, uh, that B, G, and N, and that should be noted. It's going to be a faster as far as megahertz CPU, uh, faster C megahertz, and also have uh, one meg uh, of uh, RAM, as an example. Or one meg of flash, I should say, 128K of RAM. Uh, so just keep that in mind that these guys are getting more powerful. There's also the Electron, which is the uh, cell phone based version of that. So you can actually have a 2G or 3G connection. I really like that over there update as an example. So let's switch out of microcontroller mode for a second, move these guys around. And let's switch into Linux box for, for a moment. Uh, so let me bring this guy up here and show you that. All right, this is my Beagle Bone Black. You can tell he's not plugged in. Because uh, I purchased him right when, I was a, right when the Raspberry Pi 2 came out. So I was going to move to this as my primary Linux platform mostly because it was more powerful than the original Raspberry model by a, by a substantial margin. Uh, in addition, it gave, gives you a lot more I.O. capability. You can see there's a lot more places, uh, you know, a lot more uh, per pin um, to, to place your pins. Um, you can see there's only a single USB. It also has this kind of funky HDMI micro or mini HDMI, so you have to get an adapter to hook up to your HDMI cable. So I bought an adapter off Amazon there. Just remember that, because if you don't have this adapter when you first get your Beagle Bone Black, you won't be able to do much with it um, because of that uh, uh, unusual HDMI cable output there. Uh, and it has an Ethernet port on this side, and this is where you plug it in, uh, you know, to kind of connect it to your USB and give it power. So overall, it's a great little platform, but like I said, the Raspberry Pi 2 shipped, and then I was immediately enthralled with the new power of the Raspberry Pi 2, which uh, was dramatic, a dramatic improvement when it came to uh, Raspberry Pis. So let's show you a couple other things here. Here's my Raspberry Pi 2. Let's bring him in to the camera so you can see him. So set him down there. Uh, took the case off of him. So the Raspberry Pi 2 is a very pop, uh, you know, it's one of the most popular environments out there. So if you have a question, again, you Google it, like the Arduino, it's already been solved on the Raspberry Pi, practically everything you can think of. And that's really the, the big win with the Raspberry Pi. It has such a large community. In this case, I've uh, added a Wi-Fi um, dongle and a Bluetooth dongle so it can communicate with Bluetooth devices around me here as well as communicate over Wi-Fi and it's a very powerful little guy. Uh, I also want to show you uh, this guy right here, the Intel Edison. And let's look kind of look, briefly look at this guy. So these are approximately the equivalent hardware platforms. Uh, the Intel Edison has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built right in and in this case I had to add the two dongles and they're about the same price point for that reason. Um, because you had to add $22 worth of uh, dongles to make this guy connected, uh, you know, you're now dealing with the 50, you know, upper 50, $60 range, and now, and this guy is about $55 by itself. I did add to him, so it should be noted that Edison itself is the green guy there. The red in the background is actually the SparkFun battery pack for him. So I've actually ran this guy pulling Bluetooth low energy uh, sensor data. Uh, publishing that out through MQTT, solid, you know, non-stop moving that data for three solid hours off this little battery. Um, so that's kind of nice, right? You can, I'm basically running him right now off the battery uh, just for this little video, and you can, you can see him right there. So just keep that in mind. Very powerful, uh, and also has the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in. So I really like the, the Linux platform just for, because you can actually connect to these guys. Uh, so let's actually, so this middleware screen, or this middle screen is my, Intel Edison, let's see if I can connect to him. Okay, uh, got to get the right password. And then I'm in as root. And um, so I can do things like, uh, one nice thing about the Edison, I can say, what is my node? So it has Node.js already on the board. It has Python already on board. Um, I can also see that it, it does run Linux. It has its own version of Yocto Linux that's running right out of the box there. So I'm talking to this guy, you know, through SSH. Because um, he has he has a Wi-Fi connection and he's running off his battery, so that's pretty awesome if you think about it. this really small form factor Linux box that I can interact with through SSH, um, and I can do all kinds of cool things like run Node.js commands. So let's go over here to my TI sensor tag um, node. Okay, and I can do things like 
node lux o meter. Okay, and so this is going to make a connection um, to my TI sensor tag. Let's kind of bring him into view here. There we go. I need to hit the button here that wakes him up. And then you can see it makes the connection. And then once it gets connected, it takes a little longer to connect and really connect through Bluetooth. So it's connecting through Bluetooth to this guy. And then it's pulling light meter senses from here. So if I cover this up, you can see it drops down dramatically. Open it up. Scales up. So it's pulling the light meter sensor. So this guy is awesome because it's, again, a microcontroller, uh, but it's packed full of sensors in a, and it's a nice dev kit for you to interact with. Um, I kind of, this is the newer model. I also have the older model, and you can see I ripped the rubber plastic off of him. Um, just so you can see, here's his rubber plastic right here. I just took the casing off him so you can see him. Again, a coin cell battery, just like the light blue bleen earlier. Uh, so these things run for days. I don't even know how long. I've I only had to replace them recently, and I've run them for days and days, hours and hours and hours off those little batteries. Uh, so they're a pretty powerful environment. And you can see there's our, our light sensor right there. Let me cover it back up, and you can see it drop down. Um, but because of this, I can I can come here and then do something like MQTT. I have, you know, temperature readings I can pull from this guy. So let's do a node temp humidity, and it's going to grab temp and humidity settings from the same uh, sensor tag here. So this is my Edison, right? So these two guys are talking. We'll put those two guys side by side. And you can actually see if I put my hands over it, uh, the humidity will shoot up normally if uh, just based on my hot hands there. You can see go 42, 43, 44. So you can see that it is a live sensor reading uh, based on just the heat of my hand. But I can also now jump in on this guy here. I can SSH to the Raspberry Pi. And I can run the exact same code um, on this guy because they're both Linux machines, and and this guy is going to be running uh, Node.js as well. And I can say sudo node ti sensor tag. Um, oh wait, yeah, sudo node temp humidity. Let me get the right one. And we're going to connect to this guy here. I'm going to hit the button and see he makes his connection. And same idea. It's the exact same data, but from two different sensors in this case. They're pulling it through Bluetooth and then shooting that information out over MQTT um, into the message broker running on my laptop. So we should probably make that point a little, in a little more interesting way. Let's do node temp humidity subscription. So there's the temp and humidity data coming in um, through my message broker. So it's literally coming in from this sensor through Bluetooth, connected to the Bluetooth. So the Bluetooth dongle down here. And then, of course, the Raspberry Pi is gra gra grabbing that data through um, Node.js and then pushing it back out through MQTT over Wi-Fi. And we get a chance to see that happen in real time here on the, on the um, screen. So I'm just covering it up. You can see the humidity again shooting up there to 69%, 75% based on my warm hands there. And then we'll let it go and watch it drop back down again. So the fact that you can SSH into those guys, you can run Java, Node.js, Python, whatever you want, uh, in something that's this small, running off a battery is pretty incredible. So if you're going to get, I'd encourage you from a getting started standpoint, really learn about the Raspberry Pi, uh, you know, because it's a really easy place to get started. Practically everything you might want to do has probably already been done before, and there's an instructable or someone has posted a forum posting that shows you how to do it. Uh, but the fact you can SSH into that and run your code directly on it uh, is a beautiful, beautiful thing. But I have more, I have more to show you. I want to show you some more actually about the Spark Core. Uh, so let's move things over here a little bit, uh, and let's see if this will work for me. So right now I have my other spark core down here at the bottom, and he's running a whole bunch of different sensors. You can see I've plugged in all kinds of different things in this microcontroller, the, the, the breadboard here, and set the wiring. I have uh, this guy, basically if you squeeze it, it responds a certain way. If this guy, if you flex it, it responds a certain way. It has temp and humidity, it has a light sensor. So similar to what you saw with the TI sensor tags, but I've tried to wire them all individually. This is a pressure sensor here as well uh, for physical pressure. And this is a soft potentiometer. So basically, as you touch it in different locations, it reacts different ways. And that's going to interact with this servo, uh, my servo manager over here in Raspberry Pi land. So let's do this, uh, node um, subscribe. I'm just kind of running off screen here, node subscribe. And if I did that correctly, I'm going to do this. Let's see if I got all this working correctly. So let's see here. Uh, dun, 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 dun. All right, so if you notice, I pushed on the right side and it turned that servo. So this guy right here, watch him. And you can see my messages coming in on the bottom there. So in this case, it's actually the microcontroller is reading my interactions with this piece of code. 
uh, you know, this particular uh, potenti potentiometer, and then, um, you know, translating that in PTT messages, and then sending that out to the message broker, and then we can see the servo reacting to that. And to kind of make that point a little bit better, let's go look at our active NQ, um, and let's look at the force one here, and you can see the NQ rate, let's see if we can get him to NQ, and it should go up. Uh, or is this a touch? Yeah, there it goes, 149, and then left. Move him back, and then it's 150. And then we can get a little bit more interesting. Here's my big old claw. I built a big old claw. Let's make sure he has power. And then as I touch over here, you can see he opens up and expands. As long as I maintain that pressure, he stays expanded. And when I release, he closes back up and kind of goes back to sleep. So this concept here of being able to control a machine in this case, the idea that you have sensor data moving throughout the enterprise all into MQTT, and then back out through MQTT in this case, out to this servo driving uh, Raspberry Pi as an example. So that's that's pretty nice being able to control all these guys uh, right here from this little um, set of sensors that I've created right here using the Spark Core. So I want to show you a couple other more things about Spark Core because um, it is one of my favorites because it does have Wi-Fi built in. Uh, you can see all the data, uh, the messages flowing through there. But I want to show you a couple more things about Spark Core and let's see Oh, a couple other things we ought to show you in general. Uh, one thing I didn't mention about the Edison, I know I'm all over the map, but that's just the nature of how I'm demoing today. Uh, the Edison also can be programmed from the Arduino IDE, and you can see the board here, uh, Edison and Galileo. Right now I have it set up to do the Pro Mini, but what I was working on earlier, that guy with all the little feelers living off of it. And then I can also um, uh, basically, you know, just say target Edison. So that's one thing also interesting about Edison. You can target it like it's an Arduino because it has a microcontroller on board, or you can target it like a Linux machine and SSH into it and do whatever you will. So that's very powerful and I really like that. Um, but one other thing about the Spark Core here. Let me show you this. So I'm using Atom just as a generic programming editor. And you can see I'm kind of living in, in a, what looks like C++ code right here. And there's a, um, a sensor on this guy. And this is my, yeah, this is my photo, photo resistor, right? So this, this guy right here. That guy right there. Um, so you can kind of turn them over. You can see them a little bit better. And so I'm going to actually uh, reflash it now with this code. So again, you can you you saw earlier the web programming model. In this case, I want to show you kind of the desktop programming model. I'm just editing the code here locally, and then you can go to the command line, and you can do a Spark list with their Spark uh, command line. You install that through. It's a Node.js based command line tool. Uh, you can see that both my Spark cores are online. This is Spark Core 2 over here. And then I can do a Spark uh, compile photo resistor. And it does a compile of that and produces, you can know, see the firmware is downloaded. Uh, you don't have to do a compile if you don't want to. I do that for syntax checking. But then you can immediately turn it into a flash. So Spark flash, Spark Core 2, and I'm going to give it the directory name, uh, which is photo resistor in this case. And it's going to compile that code and then send it over, and you should see the light blinking. Oh, did I target the wrong one? I may have targeted the wrong one. <laughs> I sent it to the wrong guy. Burkhor 1 is the one on my breadboard. Burkhor 2 was the other guy that's sitting over there. And if you notice, see the little light changing right here? Um, so it goes magenta, and that's when it's going through its flash cycle. So again, an over-the-air update uh, using the Spark API. Uh, one, th one thing should be noted, um, when it comes to using Spark cores in general, because it relies so heavily on its cloud environment, in this case, the Flash, you know, basically sends up your code, it does the pro, it does compile up in their cloud, and does the Flash, and it goes through an over-the-air update. Um, sometimes it just doesn't work. And in this case, um, it looks like, okay, in this case, it looks like it's going to make it through. We saw it flash green, and it's back to uh, the nice color, the breathing sea in it, it's called. And let's see if that, in fact, works. Um, debugging in the Spark controller world is via something like uh, Parlay here, and let's, let's see here, and let's go back to our programming code. You can see right here we have a serial begin, uh, but Parlay is not showing me my, oh, and it's not showing me the specific um, uh, serial port for that guy. I wonder why that's the case. So in this case, normally you can basically pull open the serial port, <laughs> connect to it here, and then you can actually see the readings coming off the microcontroller. Uh, that normally works, but it didn't work for me in this particular case while I'm sitting here making this recording. Isn't that how it works? When you're building a demo, it doesn't always work. Um, 
to show you the MQT, MQT, MQTT capability one more time, this is what that code looks like. You can see in this case we had the, this is my force sensitive resistor. Let's try to bring up the camera can you kind of see what we're talking about here. Uh, yep. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so the A4 here was this guy that we were talking to, and he's mapped over to A4 on this side of the, uh, of the spark core. And then the A3 um, was this guy, okay, as an example. Um, so basically, as you touch them, as you interact with them, it gives you a different um, rating, a reading. So if we look over here, you can kind of see what our logic looks like. So on the force sensitive resistor, if it's greater than 3,000, then we, that's enough pressure to trigger our mechanical hand over here. So the reading, you know, kind of moves based on how much pressure you're applying. So if you're putting a lot of pressure or low pressure, and you can program it accordingly, do you want the user to put a lot of pressure or little pressure, as an example? And then over here for the um, this guy, it has a range of values depending on where you touch it. So it, the range goes all the way from here at the bottom all the way up here to the top. And in my case, I decided to target just the top, the middle, and the left, or the, the, the left-hand side over here to make this servo move around, as an example. Uh, and you can see this code is still actually active um, because... So that flash earlier from the photoresistor did not actually take effect because this is still the same code running on this particular microcontroller. So I'm curious now. Let's see if that'll... Let's try to flash that one more time. Uh, flash, photoresistor, or core one. Let's see if it'll work. Okay, it's turning the right color here. And it does take a few seconds to run that flash. That's one disadvantage of the Spark Core environment because everything does operate across the cloud. Uh, you have to wait a while before, you know, it gets to be flashed correctly and it's nice and happy. So let's see if, in fact, uh, it got that new code over to it. Okay, now this is what I was expecting. So that was my problem. I didn't actually have uh, that photoresistor code flashed out there correctly. Uh, and you can see there's the values it's producing by default. Let's go back to our put it code on the code side of this. Uh, so by default, I'm looking for values greater than 4,000, bright light, uh, and if it's less than 800, low light, and you can see it's in the 2,000 range right now. So if I cover it up, uh, uh, ooh, let's do this, because I want you to see the camera at the same time. There we go. So if I come over here and cover him up, you can see the value drops pretty low, but not looks like, there we go. Just, I got it. Enough coverage to give you a low light reading, and then I can give you a bright light reading. Let me get my flashlight over here. Let's pop in with some bright light. Let's do bright light, bright light, bright light. Um, and that's essentially programming in the Spark, uh, Spark Core world. So again, watch out for that. You notice the flash didn't work for me. Maybe I did something wrong, and I will go back and review this <laughs> uh, recording to see what I did wrong there. But I have noticed sometimes it doesn't always take effect. Sometimes you get requests timed out on those flash requests. All right, so let's. Let's kind of re-summarize here. You got your you got your Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's a great place to start. Again, you can see that there's the GPIO pins there. And I guess I didn't. My other Raspberry Pi is driving my servos over here. You can see he's kind of already linked in to those two servos you saw earlier with this claw guy and this other small little servo here. And they're just basically receiving MQTT messages and responding to them uh, based on you know interaction with this board here. Um, so Raspberry Pi is a great starting point. I'd encourage you to get one of those if you don't already have those. It's incredibly popular, and like I said, anything you can think that needs to be done has probably been done already, and all you have to do is Google for the answer. The Arduino, as we mentioned earlier, in the microcontroller category is absolutely incredibly popular. Again, Google for the problem, and it's probably been solved already, uh, and that makes it so powerful, so much easier to use. I tend to start uh, most of my uh, microcontroller programming with the Arduino to figure out how to make any of these sensors work, as an example, because all the code is out there already whether it be this accelerometer here or the temperature sensor or the photoresistor, uh, and figure out how to make it work with the Arduino, and then transfer that logic over to the Spark Core environment and then flash it on to this Wi-Fi-enabled you know, Arduino as well. And then um, uh, don't forget about your embed platform. You know, he's still sitting over here. You know, and that very powerful microcontroller unit. You saw the web-based programming environment. Still dealing in C++ land. I just wish that out of the box they would kind of ship you something with Wi-Fi or something like that on board, you know, because in the area of things, we want to be connected, connectivity being very important there. Um, and one last note about the, the Bluetooth guy, just kind of popping back in. Light blue bean, pretty awesome little guy, but I, his, his uh, utility, if you will, will be limited based on the fact that um, they're relatively small, somewhat expensive, $30 for that guy. Um, and there's so much happening in this space. There's a, just a ton of innovation happening in the Bluetooth space. And uh, the last thing I'll note here, or I guess I should note what these guys are here. This is a Bluetooth beacon. 
You can use that as an asset tracker. You can see how big it is. And this is an RFID tag to kind of give you an uh, idea of size, right? This guy has a battery built into it. This guy, of course, is energized based on the RFID antenna. The scanner basically energizes it and causes it to give its reading. So I've been experimenting with RFID and a Bluetooth beacons I've spent a lot of time on also. And they basically are just running, again, these little coin cell batteries that's living inside that guy. Um, and I have lots of different beacons, like that guy there and this guy over here I've been experimenting with. Um, and so just keep those guys in mind that, you, you know, you can do a lot of interesting asset tracking, people tracking. Uh, and we're working on a system specifically right now that will do asset tracking with these Bluetooth beacons uh, if you come out and see us at Red Hat Summit. And the last note I'll make is this little Intel Edison. Again, it's about a $55, $60 unit. Again, the green component there. Uh, the battery, I think, was $25 that I added there. Um, and I have a fully portable Linux machine. I'm actually thinking of strapping him on, um, you know, wristband, making him make my own Intel Edison smartwatch at some point. Linux-powered smartwatch. How about that? Um, and all of that for $80 when it's all said and done, uh, or $85. That's pretty awesome. So that's it for now. Um, I know it was a whirlwind tour of all the stuff sitting here on my desk, and actually I didn't show you everything. I could have showed you the, the pulse sensor I've been working on. So for reading pulses, I have, a, I have a motion sensor. I've been working on that guy there, too. Um, didn't show you those today. I even have a heart monitor living over here in the corner. So there's all kinds of ways to interact with these things. Again, microcontrollers are you know very useful for embeddable uh, systems. You're dealing with K of RAM, K of storage, and then of course once you move up to the Linux boxes, you're dealing with you know megabytes or even a gigabyte of RAM, um, and then you know and you can basically bring your own SD card to give it as much storage as you want. That's what's here under this Raspberry Pi. The SD card is an example. So. That's it for my whirlwind tour. Thank you very much.